Our next speaker is Alexander Mzita, who is going to talk about quaternions, physics, and the isoclinic decomposition of SO4. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for coming. Uh, at first, I would like to thank the organizers for their great hospitality. It's a pleasure to be here again. And I will talk about quaternions, yes. Uh, let's start how the story began with um, Hamilton. And uh, Hamilton noted, Hamilton invented the quaternions and he noted that there is this peculiar three plus one structure. And uh, this is indeed something to explain. I mean, as a physicist, you uh, ask the questions why we have a three plus one dimensional space time. And he noted that this peculiar structure naturally arises in quaternions. So he always thought this is relevant for physics. And well, here we have an expert on space-time and as a physicist I apologize because I will not present any calculations or theorems or proofs. I will just try to feed your intuition and uh, by visualizing the quaternion multiplication and all what I want to tell you is how interesting is quaternion multiplication. So how we are going to visualize this. A uh, good tool is the stereographic projection. And um, by the way, all the graphics I show are from an uh, internet site of Ben Eater. He has done uh, excellent work on visualizing quaternions. You just Google Ben Eater quaternions and you find the, these clickable videos. And I have uh, made some examples. Uh, the stereographic projection in one dimension is of course, uh, you need to visualize a circle and you can project it on a line. The only problem is that, yeah, here we have the animation, little animation <laughs> with a rotation here. The only problem is that one point uh, finishes uh, at infinity, uh, but for the rest you can, with this trick, you can reduce two dimensions to one dimension. And uh, of course the same, works in two dimensions and I have again a little video that uh, shows this. You want to uh, visualize the S2 in this uh, case and you just uh, project it to the uh, plane. You, uh, by the way, you can, you can uh, put the sphere just on top of the plane or, or let it cut by the plane, but it doesn't matter. It's, no, it's not a fundamental difference here. And eventually uh, in three dimensions, uh, you have this uh, stereographic projection, projection that works as well. And uh, yeah, you can nicely visualize this. You have uh, the positions of A, G, K and in the center is the identity and you can um, visualize circles. That's the, I, uh, the J, K circle and, and, the, and the sphere. Uh, that would be the sphere corresponding to pure quaternions. And this straight line is also a circle, but in the projection it becomes a, a straight line in the real and I direction. So uh, let's have a look at the action of right and left multiplication. And now it becomes interesting because if you look closely and if you do a multiplication first from the uh, left, you see what's happening here. You, you're pushing the line here, the green line, you're pushing the line and at the same time there is a right turn in the JK direction. Vice versa, if I pull the line, the uh, rotation is um, uh, counterclockwise again. And uh, if instead you do the <coughs> right uh, multiplication with uh, these numbers here. You have the inverse effect. If you push the uh, 
red, uh, sorry, the green yellow line, you have a left turn at the same time. If you pull it, you have a right turn. So you have a different screw sense here, okay? These are very, uh, it's a fundamental difference and you can visualize this. I brought this towel, you have two screw senses. This is a right screw sense and this is a left screw sense. Don't worry, I bring that back to the hotel. And, um, but this is a very interesting feature of quaternion multiplication. And, well, um, here a philosophical sideline almost. I mean, if you think about, um, well, real numbers, you do multiplications. What about two dimensions? I want to do multiplications in two dimensions, okay? So we end up in finding complex numbers, but if you want to have a field, somehow naturally arises the concept of a rotation. And if you have four dimensions uh, and you want to do something, you want to do a reasonable multiplication, you don't have a field, but you have a um, division algebra. Uh, but now another um, qualitative feature arises, that of screw sense and helicity. And this, of course, is very exciting for physicists because uh, Elementary particles do have helicity and screw sense. That was demonstrated in 1956 by an experiment. Um, yeah, uh, she did the experiment and the discovery, and the two guys got the Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, that's sometimes the work share in physics. But at the end, we know that positrons and electrons they have different screw sense. They behave as a as a right and a left screw. And that's, this is very exciting for, for physicists. And uh, yeah, well, but, uh, last year I had an argument here with a lady who said that we mathematicians do all this for fun. And I, I objected, I said, no, this is serious, but that, uh, now she insists it's, so I would say, okay, it's, it's like sex. It's evidently it's fun, but keep in mind, this has existential consequences, yeah? So, um, you need, in physicists need to explain the very structures of reality. And one question is, how do we, I mean, what's the necessity? Why, why do we have electrodynamics? Why do we have these peculiar structures? This is the question to be explained. And um, yeah, I uh, uh, just show you now, how do you, um, how do you realize uh, rotations here? Uh, you can do that by hand. And you see, I have here a, a complex uh, multiplication in the i direction. And now I add by hand the opposite, the conjugate, and I compensate for this and ending up with just a rotation. Okay? So uh, here I have a sandwich that does it automatically and if I do this sandwich multiplication with the conjugate you end up with a pure rotation. And uh, I have done this uh, in, in other directions. That's uh, uh, now the line is in the real and j um, real and j direction. So you see a rotation here if I do this sandwich multiplication and uh, of course also I can do it in still uh, the other direction, but you, you see it's a rotation. And this is, um, this is uh, what, what quaternions are sometimes known for. Oh, it's something like a rotation in three dimensions. Okay, so you can do this very conveniently and it's nice and interesting, but uh, even more interesting is the um, sorry, the general, I hope this is the right video, no, I think, okay, so ev everyone knows how rotations and, and uh, quaternion multiplication is, is related, you can all look all this up, um, the connection between SO3 and SO2, we have this uh, double cover also, I think the double cover was, was at the end of the video here. I don't show it again, but it will, will come again. Um, but um, yeah, I should mention that, uh, the double cover, because 
you have two possibilities to realize that state and I think it's at the very end here um, if I go to minus one minus one it's the same thing than plus one plus one so for each rotation in three-dimensional space we have two elements for the for the um, quaternions and uh, now I'm realizing the general multiplication, however, without these two uh, numbers being uh, the conjugate of each other. And I have added some more circles. And uh, let's first do it with the rigid rotation, which is, as I said, uh, nice, but not that interesting, because as long as you have these sandwich numbers, uh, it's a rigid rotation. But if I take away and I do individual multiplications first from the left and then from the right and I can play around here and I get this very interesting distortions of um, the three sphere and these distortions represent the general transformation that you can apply to a three sphere. You can also add a, a sphere here just to play around and you see this sphere then transformed into a plane because if you do 90 degree rotations and it's really nice to play around with this um, but this is a uh, this is a six dimensional manifold and um, yeah it's really fun to play with this is a six dimensional manifold and uh, to emphasize this point here, I mean, if you want to rotate a usual S2 sphere, okay, you need SO3, the rotations in three-dimensional space. So to rotate a two-dimensional sphere, you need a three-dimensional transformation group. But if you have a three-dimensional uh, sphere S3, you need six, a six-dimensional group to rotate that. And this is also known, of course, as SO4, but uh, this combination of left and right multiplication with a unit quaternion is, um, is a, a representation of this SO4. The, and it's called isoclinic decomposition. Now, again, why is this so exciting for, um, for physics? Um, because uh, you can... Uh, again group these general transformations into two sets and one set I already mentioned are the rigid rotations which are require three parameters but you can realize also so to speak pure shifts and that would mean um, involving the real direction and one uh, complex direction and I do this by hand first I'm shifting the yellow green line and I am compensating by hand this uh, shift and compensating the rotation and I'm ending up with a pure shift here. So um, we have the interesting feature that these six transformations can be grouped into two distinct um, distortions and that's what reminds you from electric and magnetic fields obviously. You have again three plus three quantities and um, it's a very natural idea to relate this general transformation of the unit quaternions indeed to the electric and magnetic fields so um, yeah I should mention that uh, uh, in the uh, 19th century people were more open to these um, ideas there is a close relation to ether theories uh, I'm talking about uh, 1839 um, uh, theory of the Irish physicist uh, McCulloch who invented an uh, incompressible elastic solid and showed that it is indeed equivalent to Maxwell's equations to electrodynamics and so but he did talk about a usual so to speak elastic solid with a boring R3 but uh, the entire thing could be much more interesting if you imagine distortions generated by multiplications of the unit quaternions. And, but now we have a lot of problems, of course. And I, in first place, I'm, 
I'm here to ask help in asking questions because um, how do you realize Maxwell's equations? Uh, you imagine the electric field, everybody imagines this as a vector. But if indeed the electric field is a rotation, uh, just in first approximation, you could vectors, you could add vectors, and the superposition principle would hold. But if indeed uh, the electric field is, is described by rotations, only infinitesimal rotations add up and finite rotations do not add up. So how do you do all this? How do you, how do you phrase Maxwell's equations properly and how do you, how do you um, describe derivatives? And uh, as I said, if you have the hypothesis of left and right multiplication related to charge and SO phi related to the electromagnetic fields, how can you define differential operators properly? Can quaternion multiplication um, of elements close to unity look like vector addition? And in general, what happens if you just have a group multiplication and no addition any longer? I'm talking about unit quaternions, of course. And all these are unsolved mathematical problems. Um, yeah, and I should um, yeah, going to, uh, go to a more general perspective already. I, I'm not sure everybody can see the headline here. Why C and why H? This is a fundamental question in physics um, to um, uh, natural constants. You're not just doing mathematics in a, in a space, but uh, in physics you have constants and these are things to be explained, okay? Um, there is no reason why matter should, not, should be accelerated beyond the speed of light there is no reason for the ex very existence of, of the speed of light and uh, it, it demonstrates a failure of Newtonian physics at the large scale and on the other hand there is no reason for discontinuous phenomena in classical physics and this constant of nature H so to speak is a failure of Newtonian physics at the small scale and so again here uh, we, ha we see some problems of classical physics, of Newtonian mechanics, and these are, if you trace them back, you end up with, with space and time, and there must be a problem with space and time. Newton just accepted it as, as something three-dimensional and one-dimensional in an axiomatic uh, fashion, but as Hamilton said, um, yeah, you, you, you should like uh, to, to have a mathematical explanation for it. And yeah, well, as a sideline, I mean, uh, maybe in modern, in modern physics this is not very appreciated, but the, the job of a theoretical physicist is not to explain three dozens of fancy, supersymmetric, never observed particles. The job y is you've got to explain the fundamental structures. Why do we have three plus one dimensional space time? Why do we have the electromagnetic interaction of uh, at all, why do these structures show up in nature and not the others? These are the basic things which are left to, to be explained. And I addressed these other, this was a little bit a repetition of last year's talk. And so, yeah, again, we end up with a lot of questions. Can unit quaternions describe reality? The peculiar three plus, man plus one dimensional form arises naturally in quaternion algebra. Spin is something very intriguing. I talked about this last year. Uh, there is no reason why sh spin should exist in first place, except that it naturally arises from SO2 or the unit quaternions being a double cover of the rotations in three-dimensional space. So um, there, are a lot, there are a lot of hints and seemingly um, interesting connections here but it's very difficult to uh, phrase that all that in a technical language and this as I said I'm why I'm asking the help of mathematicians uh, yeah alternative descriptions of reality as I said the the usual concept is we have a three-dimensional space and time and uh, if you do quantum mechanics you have wave functions described by the complex numbers and obviously these uh, complex numbers of quantum mechanics and the vector fields of electrodynamics could be encompassed 
by uh, the three-dimensional unit sphere and at that point you might also think it's not talking just of replacing the fiber but also replacing um, uh, the bundle and maybe reality is best described by maps S3 mapped to S3 uh, or also the Lie algebras are interesting here or even to the general transformations of S3 which are S04. Yeah, I will end here with a quote of Hamilton, somehow quaternions are a fundamental building block of the universe and that's what he thought, that's what he discovered in 1843 and by the way you ha may have to update your pictures because uh, recently a couple of weeks ago a grave was added with Hamilton at the bridge and uh, again I apologize because uh, this is evidently not new trends but very very old <laughs> if you're interested if you're interested uh, this is last year's talk on YouTube and uh, this is my book The Mathematical Reality Why Space and Time Are an Illusion and uh, you don't have to buy it everyone uh, can get a PDF if he sends me an email so I invite you to think about these um, problems and to encourage you that dealing with quaternions is something very essential something very important for the description of space-time Thank you for your attention. talking about really about the unit quaternions so uh, quaternions are another thing and I, I'm not sure you can associate directly these four-dimensional quaternions to the four-dimensional space-time I would rather believe that unit quaternions uh, play a, a special role so uh, but b because you still have the real part and the three complex parts so um, I, d I don't see a very direct uh, application of the current formalisms, also the, the Dirac equation. There, there are ways to phrase the Dirac equation also uh, with quaternions, but um, I think we need uh, quite a very new approach here because, I mean, everything is literally screwed up here. You, you can't do, you can't do a proper differentiation, you can't do any integration anymore if you don't have a field, if you just work with unique quaternions. So it's uh, really something you needed here. Yeah. And it's possible to project the Dirac operator on the tangent space of S3 and to work with these different operators? The tangent space plays a very, uh, very interesting role um, because um, uh, I don't know that I, if it's that exactly answers, but the tangent space is important because if I go back to two dimensions and uh, the tangent space is a plane attached to this to the S2 sphere and if I walk along the plane uh, along, along the sphere I have a sequence of tangent spaces and I might interpret this sequence of tangent spaces as something three-dimensional just adding that so to speak the time dimension but at the very end I have only two dimensions and in that, in that sense, we just might have just three dimensions, not four dimensions. So I doubt if this four-dimensional formalism, on which also the Dirac equation uh, tries to describe, is, is really appropriate. I know that it's, it's, it's a, a long-held fashion in physics since 1908, since Minkowski introduced in general relativity this four-dimensional uh, description, but it's, I think it's 
it might be a superficial dead end. Yeah. Okay, thank you. What do you think about autonomy and descriptions of reality? <laughs> Next year's talk. <laughs> No, I mean, very and uh, seriously, seriously, very interesting. I mean, um, the non-associativity is is uh, is something crazy somehow, and um, there are obvious extensions. I mean, we're not done here with Octonians. You have the Cedonians and and the S thirty one, I think, and and every step you go, you're going to lose another important property. So it's it's some something like. Uh, screwing up mathematics yes. step by step and um, I don't know how, how much physics will go along but, uh, but I agree in as a matter of principle I, I, I they are always power of society hmm? they are always power of our society mm -hmm. okay okay yeah I just I'm, I'm still struggling with the non-commutativity and I, I think physicists m might need to understand this first and then go ahead yeah I think we still have time for a question that was good for an, uh, by one last speaker. Uh, and maybe we leave your question as yeah. well <laughs> for the coffee break. Um, but I would ask uh, Mr. Fred to put the, the chat so we can see the, the message, if possible. Ah, okay. So I suggest, I, I think it was Kevin Drake that was putting the uh, question. So I will ask him if he wants to uh, participate, there is his microphone on, or we can read the... Uh, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay, yes, we hear you. Thank you. So my, thank you. My question is about the signature, and I think you've addressed it partially, but your SO4 is acting on four Euclidean dimensions and you're trying to make a connection to space-time which has a different signature and I'm not seeing how you get from one to the other. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that answers you, but uh, the, the signature you, you're talking is again arising from Minkowski's um, original definition here. and. Uh, what people trying to do is to to uh, put all this into the metric and and uh, artificially introduce that sign convention but um, I think that you you still need another more natural uh, way to uh, to describe space time by quaternions yeah but this is this is of course I mean there are there are technical issues because s uh, s s3 uh, times S3 is, uh, is not uh, quite S04. There is a set two in between, and um, yeah, but I don't, I don't, see, I don't see no, no problem as a matter of principle. If I say that all this phenomenology, mathematical phenomenology, if you want, suggests that there is a deep connection between uh, quaternions and space-time. Yeah. Thank you. So let's thank the speaker once again.